Hi, everyone. Welcome to the newest Avery workshop on brand management. Um, my name is Leslie Quo. I'm the Associate Director of Development and Alumni Relations at GSAP. Really happy for you guys to join us today as we hear from three alum from different programs and in different ind industries uh, who are leading their own ventures uh, outside of uh, the GSAP disciplines. Um, and we have Chelsea Kim, the, the head of brand management for the Working Assembly. Uh, I'm going to pass it on to her now and she's going to do a, introduce herself and her company uh, before opening up the panel. Great, thank you, Leslie. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for, for joining us tonight. Um, my name is Chelsea Kim. I'm head of brand management at the Working Assembly. The Working Assembly is a branding and design studio based in New York. Um, so as Leslie mentioned, we have a really, really amazing and unique group of individuals here tonight. Um, solid combination of from like design to, to wine to, to interior. So um, you know, we'll really dig into kind of what brand management is and how um, these entrepreneurs have really like managed their brands, built their brands um, uh, through the lens of cultural stewardship. And, you know, um, I'll, I'll start by saying that I have been um, in brand management my entire career, but I think it's a very different side of of brand management. I think there are, you know, um, many, you know, I would say that there are probably two sides of, of brand management. There's one and what we call um, agency side where um, like a, a studio or a big advertising agency or whatever it is um, will work directly with clients much, you know, I would probably work with um, Amy or Nasozi on a day-to-day -day basis and um, really working directly with like clients or founders, entrepreneurs to, to help build their brands from the strategy. So developing a mission, purpose, values, and like really the foundational work of, of what the brand stands for and what the brand narrative is, and then um, developing brand identity. So that goes from logos to color palettes to actually developing, designing the website or a campaign or what a, the social channels might look like. So um, I touched almost, I think every facet. Um, and yeah, it's uh, my job really is guiding and shepherding um, entrepreneurs and founders in this kind of journey to help bring their visions to, to life. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Um, and I would love to start by having our um, entrepreneurs here with us tonight to do a little bit of an intro um, of themselves and uh, the ventures that they have built. And uh, then we can kind of dive into, into some questions. All right, um, we've got, I'm just gonna move slides. All right, first up. Rajiv. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, if there's one thing I love, it's attention. And that's what I draw, um, literally and figuratively. <laughs> so um, the, the way my journey began was I was working as an architect and um, I was just really getting sick of drawing kitchens for rich people. I was like, why am I spending most of my day doing this? Like I'm not making the world a better place. And that was, this was also in 2016 post uh, um, Trump's election. And there was just a lot of dialogue happening about, you know, making the world a, a better place and the state of the world at that time. So, um, I had the stereotypical way of being forced into doing my own thing. I got fired and uh, it was the push that I needed to, you know, go out there on my own and try to make something of my own. So I decided to become a children's book author. And that was the first brand of Little Icon. So if you go to the next slide. So you can see my work here. It started out with a children's book and then I realized 
I don't know anything about children. <laughs> so um, I started just drawing stuff to kind of express my feelings uh, in that tumultuous year. And the first image I did was a Statue of Liberty wearing the hijab and it connected with a lot of people. And I saw the power of an illustration. It doesn't take much time and dialogue can begin there. And so a lot of my work became political um, and activism focus. And then I, uh, when I went to the GSAP incubator, I completely, I rebranded again. It became an activism platform. And now at this point, it's, uh, my artist moniker. So I design under my own name, but I still just have like the Instagram handle, little icon. Um, if you go to the next slide, my my work, it's not just limited to digital illustration. It can also be translated to the building scale. So I'll never forget my architectural roots. Um, I've had some projects throughout New York City, uh, a big banner in Omaha, Nebraska, a flag at Rockefeller Center. And I have another very big and exciting project coming up I'm not telling anyone because I love surprises. So um, you know, with that, I kind of gained a knack of drawing attention to the issues that surround us. And especially last year, my a friend of mine asked me to do some icons of BIPOC people in history. And we want to focus on the lesser known people. And so we, we drew, I drew a bunch of them and we just had this collection of people and we're like, well, what should we call them? And then we're brainstorming names and we came up with historic icons or historicons. We go to the next slide. And a light bulb like went off and we're like, we should do this. Like we should bring attention to the stories that have been whitewashed from um, our textbooks. So uh, she is a neuroscientist and focuses on like education and child development. I am the, a designer who believes that kids are worthy of good design. Um, a lot of stuff for kids out there is pretty meh. So we kind of put our forces together and came up with these puzzles for kids to see representation, for us to see ourselves and feel empowered and educated about these stories that haven't been told to us and that we can learn a lot from. So the first two stories we're telling are the Stonewall Uprising and the 504 sit-in, which as an architect, we should all know about because that led to the ADA Act, which we deal with every single day. So the fact that I am 36 year old man and did not know the history behind these things and how it affects me today, I think is a disservice. And we're trying to uh, improve the world by putting these stories out there. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, and we'll also have Amy introduce herself. Hi everyone, my name is Amy. Um, I graduated in 2006 with a master's in architecture and also worked for about 10 years practicing as an architect um, and made my way uh, into a complete career pivot, uh, went back to school to study wine business and um, through our family business. Um, so now I'm the director of finance and design, which is sort of how I entered the wine world um, when we started designing our um, a new winery and um, a branded wine project. And it's called Nine Sons. If you can advance the slide, please, Chelsea. So um, Nine Sons is a, a family owned and operated winery that's in the northern part of the Napa Valley in California. And we're a really small team. Um, it's myself, my brother and sister-in-law and our winemaker. Um, and we are celebrating our 10th anniversary this year. Next slide, please. So this is a photo um, in the bottom right of our vineyard. Um, and it's also some illustrations of a well-known myth that represents our last name Chang, um, which in Chinese characters represents an archer. So there's a legend that goes that there were 10 sunbirds that took turns rising and setting in the sky each day. But one day they rose all together and their combined heat scorched the land and destroyed crops. So the archer was called to shoot down nine sunbirds and left, you know, that sort of left the one sun in the sky today um, that restored balance to the earth. So that's sort of our, our brand story. Okay, next slide, please. Um, here's some examples of our packaging, which was designed entirely in house. Um, and we make um, just a few wines, a Sauvignon Blanc, a Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, a red wine blend, Bordeaux blend, um, and a Grenache. Next slide, please. 
Um, and here um, are some of the photos of our um, newly designed and built winery production facility and tasting room and kind of, you know, maybe it gives you some idea of how the brand identity sort of became manifest in the, the physical experience of the place. So we spent over one year designing just our brand name and identity um, in collaboration with Landor Associates in a format very similar to how Chelsea described how she works with uh, with with clients. So literally just working on um, values, um, coming up with this sort of a narrative, and then working on the logo. That was it, one year. Um, we had two intentions in mind when we started working with Landor. Um, it, one was to craft a narrative experience that went from the vineyard to the bottle that really centered the experience of the consumer. Um, instead of something which is more common in the wine industry, which is to focus on a celebrity winemaker or a 100 point score from a very famous critic um, or the actual faces and personalities of the, the ownership. You know, there's a lot of family wine businesses. And second, we really wanted to honor our ancestral heritage uh, without naming our brand, you know, Chang Family Vineyards, another really common sort of approach in the wine industry. So we really view Nine Sons, the brand, as bigger than any one person involved in this project. Oh. Chelsea, we didn't hear you. Yeah, there you are. <laughs> Um, thank you, Amy. Um, and then we have Ms. Sozi. Yes. Hi. Thank you, everybody. I'm Ms. Sozi Kakembo, graduate of um, Urban Planning 2008. And my focus during my studies um, was international planning. Um, I'm the founder and creative director of XM Studio, which is a multidisciplinary design studio that works with um, artisans throughout Africa on home accents and different crafts. Next slide, please. Um, so some of what I uh, just told you is, is stated here. I founded my, my brands when I was living in Brooklyn, New York, um, and that was in, in 2011. So a few years after I completed my studies at Columbia. At the time I was working full-time in the international development and human rights, social justice fields um, for the Open Society Foundations. Um, so I really got to experience um, from that side of things, kind of the way that money can move um, around the world. And I was also simultaneously still interested in figuring out a way to incorporate um, the arts and obviously some of what I uh, learned in graduate school into um, something kind of independent that I wanted to do for myself. So I established the brand as a hobby in 2011. And then in 2013, um, decided to try it out full time. So I left uh, the Open Society Foundations and hit the ground running with just kind of a, a nebulous idea in the back of my mind um, of creating a brand that had beautiful things, but also was inspired by um, and centered around a philanthropic mission, albeit not one um, backed by a multi-billionaire as I, I was working for at the Open Society Foundations. But in that time, I got to really understand and appreciate that there were other ways that smaller amounts of money um, and intention and strategy could make a big difference. So that's what I set out to do with my brand. Next slide, please. Um, so in terms of our brand values, which I'm sure we'll circle back to a little bit deeper toward the, toward the end or toward the Q&A, um, but our five points are ethical, diverse, eco-friendly, small business, and authentic. And um, that in part traces really back to my heritage, my both Ugandan and American heritage, um, as well even touching um, into some parts of Europe. My family spent a lot of time in Germany. So the home that I grew up in was very kind of Northern European, minimalist, African, <laughs> East African. Um, and uh, these were always, you know, kind of decor and items and principles that I grew up around. Um, in the bottom left-hand corner, you can see a picture of my, my mother and I and her bag, her purse, that is actually a purse that is made in Uganda and it's very common um, in East Africa. And I sell very similar purses today. Um, so these are 
really just, uh, you know, these are pieces today that have told my, my entire life story. Um, on the far right hand side, you can see one of the artisans that I work with, her name is Agnes, and she's originally from Rwanda and emigrated to Uganda around the time of the Civil War um, in, the, in the early 90s, early to mid 90s. Um, and here she's actually dyeing the, um, the, the raffia grass that is used to produce the baskets that you see here. There's one behind me that way. Um, and then also on the screen here. So that's how the process really begins. And then in the middle, beneath the basket, I'm working on a batik collection in Ghana. Um, so that, you know, really getting my hands um, on, on the work to understand the work, uh, gain an appreciation for it, and then work with artisans who are actually the experts because I have the vision and they, they help to execute the vision. Next slide, please. Uh, and one of the most exciting parts um, that really pulls the brand together is, is my logo. Um, there have been several iterations. The logo, like so much more of my, my company and the branding and the strategy actually evolved very organically uh, over the years. Um, and there was at some point a friend who pointed out to me that the logo resembled these soffits that are in my home in Uganda. And my grandfather built this home in the 1940s. And so I found that very special that somehow like subconsciously that that motif from the soffits, which let the air go, you know, flow from the outside to the inside of the home of our home in Uganda and the hills um, has found its way into my company logo and, and really stands for, again, something much bigger um, than, you know, just me and the items, but what the entire mission is behind the company and the brand. And um, furthermore, Uganda is a very mountainous and hilly country on the far right hand side. Um, that's my son on a trip there probably six or seven years ago. And we went hiking and we were up in the mountains um, at the Sezibwe Falls in um, just outside of Mukono, not too far from where, where this home is, where our home is there. So the mountains are also reflected in the logo. My name, Nasozi, means mountain peak. So it's really a visual that's meant to envelop all of those things. So thank you. Amazing. Thank you all so much. Um, I am, what I'm going to do is actually, before I move on, I'm just going to stop sharing screen because I think that's it. Um, yeah, I, you know, I was just thinking about how you all kind of started from this one discipline. Um, and obviously all alums of GSAP, but have ended up in like completely different places. And so I would love to know just what was the most challenging aspects of, of building your brands and, and how in getting to where you are, are today. Um, we can uh, start with Amy. Um, I was thinking about this a lot, just being middle-aged myself. <laughs> um, I think that any journey, professional journey is sort of um, very parallel to your personal journey, which, you know, it's like you go through puberty, you go through your early career. Uh, right now I'm sort of like mid-career, but I've also experienced a pivot, right? So do you consider that a start over or is it just a continuation or, or a thread that starts weaving together, you know, multiple different experiences in your life? And I, and I do feel the older you get, you know, those different threads start to actually come together. And I think that, you know, when it comes to branding, um, it was very difficult to start out 10 years ago. Um, you know, we had a hard time talking about our brand. I think we intuitively, and because it was a family business, you know, we all knew each other very well, like over our lifetimes. So we had some shared values. Um, so we had an intuitive sense about where we wanted the brand to go. And again, it wasn't about creating an aesthetic or um, sort of so defined in terms of the mission of the company. And I think that evolves over time. And if, if I look about, if I look back, you know, over the past 10 years, that evolution has been really important to, you know, changing with economic times, you know, the COVID situation, um, 
uh, all sorts of things. So, you know, I think it's, it's a process and it's a, a, a maturity that happens naturally just as it does in our own self identity. Thank you. Um, Nasozi, do you wanna answer that as well? Yeah, um, for me, it's really been a, a very organic journey because when I started the company, um, I was really just looking for a creative outlet. I ended up in a very kind of technical field that didn't relate exactly to urban planning, but even within urban planning, once I got into the, into the curriculum and the discourse, I realized it was such a rich field. It was so, and it is so multidimensional. So the, the original challenge was just to decide what I wanted to focus on in school. <laughs> Um, and then afterwards, um, you know, the world was just, it was so open and the opportunities were really endless. So for me, because I have so many interests um, and this really, the, the brand, I've, I've been able to kind of cultivate a focus that touches on those various um, interests of mine, because you wouldn't think that urban planning and, and textile design necessarily had anything to do with each other but for me they're just two sides of the same coin um, of a multi-dimensional coin that has more, more than two sides um, because there is that social impact and um, women's economic empowerment and you know all of those pieces that do play into the mechanisms that shape our world um, and the textiles and the crafts are the conduit um, for that, and they're also the channel for conversations that you know that can take place um, amongst and between different cultures um, to really understand ways in which we're similar and ways that we can really help each other and and be one community. So the the pieces seem disparate, but for me, they they are very similar. It's just a matter of figuring out how to articulate that over time. Um, and the brand and the business have, have helped me with that personally, that personal journey um, as Amy has also touched on. Yeah, and I, Rajiv, I feel like you you touched on that too a little bit, um, just kind of like transforming from like where you started as, as a like kind of children's book to um, becoming an illustrator and creating this like activism platform and so like, you know, those values that Nisozi is also drawing on, I feel like kind of apply to, apply to um, you and your journey as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, when I started Little Icon, uh, the question that I wasn't able to answer for like two years is what's the purpose of Little Icon? And, um, and I remember the driving thing behind it was like, I'm gonna make money like selling books and, you know, doing this. Well, the book was a flop, <laughs> but, um, but my but the fact that it was being driven by like i'm going to make money doing this i was not answering the question at all like what is the purpose and with historicons money has never been um part of the answer of why we're doing this it's always been mission driven and it took me a couple years to get to that point with a little icon is i want to create dialogue and i'm doing that through visuals uh, with historicons is we want to educate and empower children based on their identity. So being able to answer that simple question and always making your decisions go back to that main um, answer is what keeps your brand authentic. And authenticity is something you cannot fake. And you you know your customers can see that. Uh, with a little icon in the beginning, I was so hung up on Instagram followers and it took me a long time to realize that's not a way to gauge success. Um, the best way to gauge success is through, I think the responses from people to see, like when someone says, hey, this drawing really connected with me because I, in one particular instance, I, uh, I, I drew um, a woman who's a survivor of sexual assault. They said this, like, you know, I haven't been able to talk about my experience with sexual assault but for some reason this drawing you know gave me a little courage to do that and having that responsibility is something that like money cannot um like satisfy so you know knowing that you're putting something out 
there in the world that someone else can use. Um, that that's I think a meaningful response to making a brand successful. Thank you. That's amazing. Um, you know, you kind of touched on mission driven brands and I, I want to dig into that a little bit too, because I do think that there, you know, there is a trend of, of purpose driven brands, mission driven brands. What does that really mean? Because I, I think the, the meaning of, of mission driven or purpose driven has been stretched a little bit, um, particularly with like legacy brands, you know, that may not have a mission or let's like diversity or heritage, you know, at their, at the core of their DNA. Um, so I want to just dig into your thoughts on can brands do this authentically if it's not a part of their DNA, the way that it, it is for, for your brands? Um, I, I can, I'll start with this one. Uh, so with the Storicons, we actually just um, went over this because we are a for-profit company. We believe you can do a lot of good and make a profit off of it. Um, but we also realized that, you know, many of the stories that we're going to tell are not our own history. So, you know, while like the Stonewall Uprising, the 504C, um, 504 sit in, you know, we have like personal connections to them. Like we don't have a personal connection to like black history. So we, we realize that we cannot be profiting off of this and we need to, you know, bring in someone else who, who can tell that story and profit from it or, and also have a give back component. And I think that's also become a real mo like a, a model of millennial run companies nowadays. Absolutely. I think like, there is definitely an aspect of bringing someone on if you if you certainly don't have like the expertise in that field. Um, Ms. Izzy, I saw you kind of like unmuting. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'll I'll just jump in quickly and and talk a little bit about my experience from the kind of wholesale or or re retail side, the supply side. So I work with a lot of um, of the big stores and the big names, um, and part of my business. Uh, part of my business operations is wholesale. So I have a website and I also supply to brick and mortars, independent shops, e other e-commerce shops, et cetera. Um, and it has been really interesting over the past year in particular, um, starting from last summer's racial uprising with the you know the George Floyd killing, et cetera. Um, there was a deluge of attention that black businesses, including myself and the businesses of other, um, black owned small businesses, small businesses that are owned by my friends, the like volume of attention that we got um, out of seemingly out of nowhere. Um, and many of the brands that I can say approached me were brands that I had been um, approaching and knocking on the doors of for close, this is now my 10 year, my 10th year in business also like Amy, <laughs> um, my 10 year anniversary um, is actually this month. But I had been knocking on the doors for the better part of a decade, um, and there was no real interest there. But then all of a sudden, when Black businesses are, you know, and Black lives are thrust into the spotlight um, in the country and around the world, then they, you know, now want to have, you know, Black businesses on their shelves. Um, that obviously didn't feel genuine. And so... I think maybe five or so years ago, if that had been the scenario and I was in an earlier place in, you know, in my business journey, perhaps I would have um, felt more compelled or obligated to participate in those quote unquote opportunities. But, um, you know, really I'm also realizing that collectively a lot of small businesses owned by black business owners are, you know, we're saying no because, or we're setting terms going into into these agreements and we're saying, you know, we wanna see what your strategy is for including other black businesses beyond me so that I'm not the token. And, you know, what does your upper management look like? And we need to have a conversation about that because we're now in a position for the very first time in my lifetime, if not at least my career journey that we actually have some leverage and it's a very new thing. And I mean, like I said, I've been in this for 10 years and it's a very, very stark difference in terms of the volume of opportunities, but then also the quality of the opportunities. But 
just being able to have a little bit more bargaining power now has made a really huge difference um, in terms of uh, having influence um, in, you know, at, at those tables where for whatever reason, you know, the voices are not all around the table. Um, I don't think there's really any excuse in, in larger companies for there not to be representative voices all around, but that's another story, <laughs> another conversation. But that's been my experience from, from the um, small business owner side and the retailer side. I mean, no, that's, that's um, really, I think it's, it's so important because I, I've also had very similar experiences as like our design studio is, is owned by um, a Korean American woman. Um, I don't know of very many other agencies, ad agencies, branding agencies that are um, female and minority owned. Mm -hmm. And so of course there has been an influx of attention with like, okay, a lot of companies that have taken on these initiatives of you know, having an agency that is, um, you know, minority owned or female led or whatever that is. And it's almost, it, there is a little bit of tension of like, you know, I, like you are excited about the, the opening of these opportunities and that aperture, but in some right. way, like, it, like it, 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 there's a level of like, is this disingenuous? And mm -hmm. so I totally understand. And I think that is, you know, a really important conversation. Um, Amy, I know that like, you know, like you were, you had mentioned, you know, kind of doing things a little differently than some of the other winemakers and vineyards and not doing the, like not using your last name, for instance, as you know, other, um, winemakers do. And so, um, and also just, you know, your, the branding is so beautiful. The packaging is so beautiful. Um, and, I see how your heritage kind of is is coming through in the branding and packaging. Does it come through kind of anywhere else in the experience or um, whatever, like it may be? Um, I mean, I think it's really important to note that when we launched our brand 10 years ago, the wine landscape was really different. So uh, in a decade, it's changed dramatically in that at that time, um, mainland Chinese wine consumers were sort of saturated in the market and even purchasing chateaus in Bordeaux and the Western wine world really looked down negatively upon all of that. Um, so I think there was a lot on our plate in terms of um, our own cultural heritage. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, Wine Specter, Spectator, which is one of like the most major periodicals in the wine business, um, first printed information um, about us incorrectly and said, you know, it was the Chen family who, you know, were immigrants uh, or, you know, living in China. And so no one had contacted us. And I think that gives you a bit of an idea of the, the context at that time. So we had to call them, you know, correct them and said, no, we're Asian American, you know, born in the United States, still live here. Our last name is Chang, you know. So I think um, you're sort of looking at, and this is sort of dovetailing onto what Nasozi and Rajiv were saying, with legacy brands, it's really tricky because, or the establishment in general, the status quo, let's say, because you know it was a system created inherently in, 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 with inequity, right? It's looking at a kind of specific consumer, for example, if you're gonna get into like marketing techniques and the um, sort of academic piece of brand management. So do you sort of try to assimilate into that system or do you just go off and do your own thing? And I think we recognized right away we were outsiders sort of from our ethnic background, um, certainly coming from outside of the industry. None of us had uh, an education in enology or in agriculture. We didn't grow up in you know the Napa Valley. We didn't come from a wine family. So I think from the outset, we just knew that um, we were going to have to operate in what we felt was true to our values um, and our vision. And that meant we listened to a lot of sort of the rule book of how to launch a cult wine brand. Um, and we took very little of that moving forward. You know, again, we spent years as the construction of our winery was occurring to sort of consider the launch of the brand and, and what it would mean. Um, so I think like our brand is actually quite 
Asian American. <laughs> um, I don't, you know, I think that there were other brands that launched in Napa around the same time as us in, in around 2010, 2012. And they, the, you know, like Yao Ming, the basketball player had his, had a really big wine launch. And you can look at the, the visuals of that. And it is very Chinese, Chinese characters, a lot of the color red, gold, those types of things. So we consciously chose not to have sort of a Chinese or Asian look. Um, I think that the brand appeals to anyone, whether you you have an, you're, you know, you have an Asian descent or not. And, and I think that's, um, again, it wasn't, it wasn't as conscious, I think, in terms of, um, it wasn't about aesthetic. It was really about a narrative and our personal experiences and our story, and then how to translate that into the experience for the customer. The focus is on the customer, right? Um, and I think that's allowed us to weather, you know, the Chinese consumer sort of falling off the market, no longer interested in wine in the way they were. Um, and, um, you know, the brand can evolve over time, right? It, it's, it has, it's independent of us. And I think that was something that probably is the most successful piece of our brand story. Um, were you and, you know, all of your other family members that were involved, were you guys always just like aligned in, 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 in the entire process? Were, were there disagreements? Like, was there ever a conversation where someone was like, we shouldn't lean into our heritage or we should like, so yeah. curious. It was, you know, about 10 people around a table. I'm sure our design team hated us because we, none of us could agree. But, you know, I think out of that conflict arose, it was a creative process. And I think that's something everyone here on the Zoom today can really appreciate. That's that's the journey piece that makes, create something great. It's, it's a collaborative process with a lot of disagreement and a lot of respect for each person's individual expertise. Um, and I think that, you know, the design education is one in which we learn how to sort of research and, and expand out and then take all of that information and turn it into something, right? And communicate something to other people. And I think that my having an architectural um, educational experience really helped um, bring, bring that process forward. Um, so, you know, I, I very much am, am grateful for that. And in fact, the, the, of the nine final logo designs presented by Landor, the one we ended on was the last choice at our first meeting. It was number nine. And we just went back and looked at it and like kept working on it and ended up with this. So, it, you know, again, it's, it's a design project. Um, I can, I can relate to that <laughs> just on the other side. <laughs> hey, maybe there's something that you weren't liking that first round that maybe you like now we're just, we're just going to bring it back. It was like left on the chopping block, but maybe. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I was just thinking about, um, Rajiv, you had, um, previously mentioned just, um, like, I, I guess if you had, how do you use your voice as like a plat platform for conversation? Like, how do you, you you've talked a little bit about the different mediums in which your illustrations show up. Um, and so I just like, how do you start that conversation? Is it just about having or creating something that is provoking? Um, would love to know a little bit about your process and how you how you come to that final um, product and that illustration or design. Yeah, a, lo a lot of my work is like reactionary to like a current event. So that's the beauty of illustration is like I can put out a drawing in like half an hour. Actually, my best drawings are my most my most well received drawings are the ones that take the least amount of time. Um, and, and I realize that this because like you don't think you just put stuff out there and the simpler it is, the easier it is for other people to digest and and relate to. Um, so, you know, I, I beyond just putting like my own work out there, like through Instagram or like on my website, um, I have started working with other groups and, you know, the timeline might be a little bit longer than say like a day or two, but there's still like an overall issue that's happening. So for example, uh, this project I'm doing right now in Chinatown um, is all about putting these like motivational messages out there 
but using English, Chinese characters, and a pictogram to kind of bring together, um, you know, three different types of communities uh, that read, you know, different things. Um, so, especially this past year where there's been so much anti-Asian sentiment. Um, but I, I saw I saw a question about like my, my heritage being a part of it. Um, and I've noticed that I'm not one of the artists who like only draws like Indian American issues. Um, and it's it kind of it's hard for me to kind of relate to like the stereotypical Indian American um, experience because I don't have a typical experience. Like I am a brown man from Council Bluffs, Iowa, uh, who's queer and has a Indian first name and a Hispanic last name. Like nothing makes sense. <laughs> so you know, like it, it's it's hard for like my work just to be so um, focused on one thing. So the the nice thing, so so with little icon, it's there's a diversity of issues and topics that I do. Um, so uh, it, it allows for variability in my work. And I, and I think that's uh, something that's important if you want to work in more than one type of field. So being able to work on things like creating stickers for people versus creating like a building mural. You know, it's very, you have to be able to adapt to what the client or what your users, um, how they want to portray your work. Yeah, totally. I, I think it's it's always tricky. And I think that's probably like one of the most difficult part of your jobs is like, how do you please a client? How do you also make sure like your point of view is coming through and like your voice? And then how do you also like make sure that it's, you know, it's something that whatever, whoever the consumers are, whoever your audience is, is something that they can relate to or at least understand. Well, so to, to add to that, you know, as, as architects, we all have this experience where we all have like pretty good taste. And then we have to deal with our client who usually doesn't. And, you know, you have to make concessions, you know, just to make them happy and move the project along. And, you know, what I, for Historicons, what I envisioned at the very beginning is not what the product looks like at all. And that's because I listened to our potential customers and they gave us feedback that I didn't consider before. But in the end, I think it's actually a better uh, product. It, it, you know, I, I'm not the one who's going to be benefiting it from it. Uh, well, I am, but, um, you know, like little kids, I need to understand how little kid thinks. So. Right. I think even just talking about all the different, you know, voices that you're listening to and incorporating the Sozi, I, you, I, deal with so many different aspects in your business like there's a wholesale part of your business you also offer interior design services which just love how you kind of juggle all of those different aspects of the business and um maybe like what you enjoy the most um i think the interior design services that you're providing could you can probably relate to rajiv in in a lot of ways of like what do you give the client versus you know and like who like the voices that you're listening to Right. So yeah, that, that has in a way been a, been a challenge, but also something that I'm coming to terms with. And then I think that, I think my audience and my clients um, are in full appreciation and awareness of is that my brand is unapologetically a reflection of my own taste. <laughs> um, it's a reflection of my personal taste. Um, and it's an extension of that. It's an extension of my childhood home, um, my current home, my apartment in Brooklyn, my home in Uganda, the places I've traveled, um, and that comes through. That comes through very clearly in, you know, the the product descriptions um, on my e-commerce website, in you know the the landing and kind of info page, the about page on my interior design component, my interior design area, my. Instagram is very, very personal in terms of the stories that, you know, that disappear in 24 hours. <laughs> I try to keep the timeline like very on brand. Um, but, you know, sometimes in the stories is where I share a lot of like Ugandan history or what's happening in Africa, what's happening in Brooklyn, what's happening in my house, different projects that I'm working on, which 
Um, you've also, uh, you spoke to earlier uh, before we got on the, on the call together, but um, I think it goes back to the authenticity and like, if you truly believe what, you know, believe in what you are doing and who you are, what your brand, brand is about, then others will believe it too. <laughs> they'll they'll buy into it. Um, and so for me, I just I I have to remind myself that that's what makes my brand unique. That is why people are coming to me. If that is why they're buying my brand, that is why they want um, you know me to design their homes because there's something different and unique that I'm doing that I can bring that somebody else that they can't get anywhere else. Um, and so that's really the mo most unique thing about the brand is that it's a reflection of me and my very unique story. There's nobody else with, with my exact story or my exact journey. So, um, you know, really the brand is a translation of that um, in the kind of home decor and interior form. Can't hear you. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um, completely agree. I think, you know, even um, because I am on the agency side, I think there's a lot, a lot of times where I'm faced with, you know, client being pretty like didactic about what they want and how they want it to come to life. And, you know, those conversations I'm, I'm having like every day of, yeah. Hey, like, why did you, why did you hire us? Why did you come to us? <laughs> if this, if you know, this is what you want, but this is not really, you know, our voice or really like our, our values either. So, um, yeah. couldn't, <laughs> couldn't agree more. Um, <laughs> I also, um, just wanted to touch a little bit. I think we touched on this a little bit in the beginning, just kind of like mission and, and, and mission driven, purpose driven brands. But, um, you know, there's also been this term of like, you know, being a disruptive brand, being a challenger brand. And um, I also think that in a lot of ways, the meaning of, of that, of those words have been stretched a little bit too. But um, I think in a good way, in a more inclusive way, I think it's it's also brought in a lot of, you know, like smaller businesses, emerging brands. And so um, I I see you guys as, as being disruptive in your own respective rights. And so um, would love to hear a little bit about whether you consider yourself to be a disruptive brand or a challenger brand and, you know, kind of in the ways that you're you're doing that. Um, Oops, um, Amy, love to hear from you. Um, I mean, I think something really helpful that came out of last year's Black Lives Matter protests and just sort of all of the graphics that were created on social media. Um, and I, I'm, I really apologize. I forget the woman's name um, who sort of wrote about and then people were rep making graphics um, for sort of this idea that when it comes to dismantling systemic racism, there are many lanes, right? And we, you sort of have to know what your skill set is and you can be in your lane. You don't have to be all of these different pieces. And I think when we hear about brand design or people who start their own business, it's sort of that larger than life entrepreneurial, um, you know, very engaging extroverted person. Well, I mean, I don't, I think there are a lot of other options. And so I wouldn't ever think of our brand as sort of being overtly disruptive, but you know, Chelsea, your question got me thinking about what, what does that mean for, for our business? And, you know, we don't sort of broadcast in a public way, how we're doing things differently. And I think, you know, one good example, I'm definitely not going to claim that we can, you know, make progress solely on climate change, for example. But you know, we have we're a cult wine brand. It's it's a very high price point. And what's typically done, you know, in terms of packaging is to ship three bottles of wine that's very thick, heavy glass, you know, with all sorts of materials, extra materials in a wood box that's wrapped in a styro styrofoam shipper. And literally it's received by the consumer and you know all of that's discarded immediately. So we just decided, well, we're not going to do that. Um, you know, this is people spending up, you know, thousands of dollars on wine. 
And we, we said, we're going to design cardboard and um, it, it should look good enough to remain in someone's collection, um, but also can be recycled. And so, you know, that's not something we sort of publicly broadcast, but we just, we had a hunch about it. We, we came out with a $250 bottle of wine, which was very high for a launch. And, um, but we put it in cardboard and it was just different. Like the, the way we designed the inserts, um, the way we, you know, it, it came in it's sort of its own shipper. So again, we cut down on waste, no styrofoam. Um, you know, the, the consumer loved it. Um, so again, I think there's ways to think, you know, that is, that to me, that's a disruption. And we've talked about moving into 2022 that we're actually eliminating the box because it's still too much waste. So we're gonna go down to like a pulp shipper because we feel that, which is, which literally can, you know, go in the tub and disintegrate. So, you know, we think, feel strongly that after 10 years of building the brand and what we're about, you can change all of these, what's perceived as luxury items that people are paying for. People are paying for the experience, right? About how they feel connected to the brand. So, um, you know, we're trying to do these types of things, um, which is, it, it is it, it's, it's very much about environment. It, stuff happens in the vineyard stuff happens in our packaging. Um, we try to reduce waste all the time, but you know, that's sort of behind the scenes. If a customer asks like, how come it doesn't come in a wood box? We'll talk about it. So I think it, it's, it's, it, it's, it, that's our lane, so to speak. That's really interesting. I, you know, for a time where everyone wants to scream about, you know, all of the sustainability initiatives that they might be doing. I really do love that approach of like kind of going the other way and not acknowledging it all, but doing it, you know? Um, Nisozi, do you, do you have anything to add to that? <laughs> I'll quickly add, because I know we're gonna jump <laughs> over to Rajiv and then the Q&A soon, but um, in term, I'll focus this, area, this question on uh, my charitable work uh, that I do with the orphanage school in Uganda. Um, one, because my business is, it's for profit, but it has the social impacts mission still at its core. One of the takeaways that I got in working at a multi-million billion dollar philanthropy for many years is just that there's a lot of efficiency, inefficiency in philanthropy and in giving and in charity. Um, there are a lot of, you know, there's a lot of red tape, there's a lot of bureaucracy, there are a lot of departments, lots of papers. And I was in the president's office um, in grant and strategy review. So I got to see all of that. And it was a very insightful um, and a really great learning experience for me because when I decided that I wanted to somehow incorporate giving into my very, very small business, um, I knew that it really, would be a different thing and be disruptive for me to establish direct relationships with the organizations and with the people that I wanted to be um, partnering with. So that's exactly what I did. I found, I went around uh, Kampala and spoke with different family members about organizations there and ended up uh, connecting with an orphanage school that's in, in my village in Uganda, just on the other side of the valley and like walking over there and having a meeting with the executive director at his desk and he handed me a list of different um, priorities of projects that they wanted and, and needed to tackle on their campus and we went from there um, and whenever I needed to kind of check in to see how the work and the progress is going I can text message him on whatsapp we were text messaging even the other day we've been um, partners since 2014 um, or I can send a family member over there, you know, it's a quick walk from my house. So I can send anybody over there to check in on them, especially during COVID. It's been, um, you know, really essential to have that direct line of, of communication. And then also a, a much um, more customary way of handling business that doesn't, that does not fit into the American paradigm. It's a very, you know, much more traditional way of handling business because they, we know each other's families and they ask, you know, how's your son doing? How's your mom doing? How's your dad doing? And there's this whole piece that um, you don't so much experience on this side of the business, but in Uganda, we do things a little bit differently. So it's just disruptive in, in that sense, but I um, just really strive to have a direct connection to, um, you know, the quote unquote charity, which we also don't consider it charity in, in Ugandan culture. It's actually just what you do. <laughs> um, it's what you do. So uh 
in that sense, again, it's not something I set out to necessarily do or be called disruptive, but um, looking at it through the lens of, you know, how we kind of normally operate here. Yes, I would say so. Yeah, I mean, it's almost like it's just like part of your DNA and then like part of your brand's DNA and in a lot of ways, like, you know, like tangentially similar to like Amy and, you know, nine sons being like, we're just going to do this and it's going to be part of our DNA and we're not going to scream about it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. very, like, very interesting. Um, Rajiv, did you have something to add as well? Yeah. Um, as uh I, I wouldn't say like we're dis disrupting like the toys and games industry completely, but I feel like we're adding we're adding to it. We're bringing a perspective that hasn't been shown. We're telling the stories that you don't see in kids' uh, products um, from the ed from the education side and design side. You know, you don't see like good design <laughs> that often. So um, you know, that's a challenge for me, but also provide something that you know a kid would be interested in playing with and dealing with um you know we, another goal of ours is to be the first toys and games company that is b core certified so sustainability is a priority of ours and it's actually presenting a lot of challenges right now um i could easily make our magnetic puzzle in china but that <laughs> defeats the purpose of a sustainable um sourced product so, you know, it's forcing us to be really creative in hacking a product and um, putting something out there that, you know, we can prove over time is sustainable. Um, yeah, in that, in that sense, those are the, the type of things that we're trying to disrupt because I, uh, I do a lot of Googling. I've sourced where all these other people like produce their work and it's all coming from China. So I know exactly how big their carbon footprint is. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Um, I like, I'm so curious, do you, um, did you also have to do like separate research on just like children's to toys and like how they are like, how easy or hard do you make it for, you know, certain ages and stuff? It's, it's like, to yeah, definitely. Like well, right, right now we're, we're testing our product with our audience. And so we've gotten a ton of great feedback. Um, you know, we're saying like the puzzle, it's a 30 piece puzzle right now. And, you know, parents are saying, well, my older kid would like to do this, but you know, they need like a 200 piece puzzle. So, you know, we wouldn't do a magnetic one for them. We do a traditional jigsaw one. So these are all things that we're learning, but, you know, kind of like, uh, what Amy and the associate have said, like we, we have to start small and then we can add to, you know, our brand as time goes on. Um, I think the worst thing to do is try to start with like the whole package at the beginning. Um, people want to be, they want to feel like they're helping build the brand and, and you can't build it without their input. So we have to, me and my partner, we've had all these different ideas and we've had to keep reeling ourselves back in and just like focus on one thing. And then over time, we'll add something new to the, to the overall package. Thank you. Um, I agree wholeheartedly on focusing on, on that one thing. And then like kind of having to build on top of that. I feel like I'm always having to remind um, my clients like, Hey, let's focus on this one thing. Like we can't, we can't build out all of your sub logos until we have this logo for your master brand. And so it's kind of similar, same, same, but different. Um, I know that we are almost out of time and we want to open up for, for Q and a. So, um, I, uh, I can just pass the mic back over to Leslie. I don't know if you've been getting any questions in the chat. Um, not yet, but will we uh, give people a chance to digest this conversation so far? I just want to thank each of you. This has been incredible for me to hear about your stories and the way that you've approached your, your businesses and how personal it is. It's, um, it's, I definitely got goosebumps sometimes and um, I am so envious of the way that you have each chosen to spend and invest your time and energy. And so thank you so much for 
for sharing. Um, I'm, I'm going to start with one question, give the panelists a little bit of a break and ask Chelsea one just from a macro level um, <laughs> as a brand uh, manage, head of brand management at an agency. Are, are you sort of having questions from your clients? that are a little different now, like in, in the past year, are you seeing some, some more um, emphasis on certain priorities um, that, that weren't around maybe two years ago? And then other people, if you're ready for a question, just raise your hand, turn on your mic or, or whatever you're comfortable with. Um, yeah, I think there's a few parts to that. Um, I think when the pandemic hit, um, like big advertising agencies got hit really, really hard. Um, and um, there are a lot of layoffs. And I think there was just kind of a reckoning within the advertising industry of like these big companies being really, really bloated. Um, and so lots, there were just um, lots of layoffs. And of course, like, the first thing to get cut um, in any, you know, recession, financial crisis, any sort of pandemic is the marketing budget. So a lot of big advertising marketing budgets were getting cut. You weren't able to go on productions and produce campaigns. So those budgets were getting cut. But funny enough, um, I being in like the branding and design side of things now, um, there were a lot of startups that were forming during the pandemic as people were, you know, kind of being laid off or being furloughed. People also that took it as an opportunity to kind of explore what, you know, another venture might be. And so I kind of found that 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 was just like more of a trend that I found um, interesting. And you know, our agency was like, we were bracing ourselves for not, you know, not have being able to get any new business. And then, um, and then it was quite the, quite the opposite. I think just in terms of what um, companies are, are looking for, what clients are looking for. Um, I would say that a lot of companies are mandating a diverse team um having like div the just in terms of like your age background ethnicity um like all of that is that that's actually become a request from clients and um i find that um i f i mean i think it's a good shift but i also thought it was a little um I thought it was interesting. I, to be honest with you, like, I don't know of, of very many agencies or studios that are able to fulfill on that, especially in my field. I think there is a, you know, like the agency that I'm at is probably one of the most diverse and we're only 25, 30 people. And um, I would say that like, we are very, very diverse. And it's also probably because it is, you know, minority owned and female led. Um, I wouldn't, I can't say that for the previous agency that I was at. So um, I found that to be um, a, an interesting request. And then obviously just, um, there's been a lot of health and wellness brands that have been emerging and coming. Um, it's not my favorite to work on these days, just because everyone seems to be diluting what health and wellness really means. And everyone wants to just talk about wellness as like, it's a journey, you know, no matter what, where you are, we'll meet you on your journey. And so it's just, um, it's, it's, I feel like it's getting a little played out and I don't know how, how to spin it anymore. <laughs> so hope that answers your question. That, that was, that was great. Um, Samina, did you have a question or are you just, did you have a question? I, I have another one, so. Um, no, I just wanted to thank everybody. I mean, I this is really fascinating for me and um, 
I was Amy's classmate, so it was nice to see her. So hi. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I guess for me, um, it's funny. My journey is very funny because I used to be, at, in, I started my career in 1999 as a computer and Java programmer. And I, so I was at the beginning of all of this. You know, I remember when my friend Artie Merritt was talking about mobile was the next big thing. And it, here we are, you know, um, <laughs> lots of people don't have computers anymore. Um, but uh, I, as I have, you know, grown and I'm now, you know, an architect and I have left um, a very technical field um, uh, as well, uh, uh, facade consulting. And I started my own firm a couple of years ago and it's, it's been a long time for me to build to the point where I'm actually taking clients and doing, trying to do my own projects. I'm at this point where um, I have to go into the social media realm and I've just found myself like so resistant to um, making my person, my personal life <laughs> part of my brand. And it seems so like necessary to th show that authenticity all the time. And I really struggle with it because I just, I just feel very resistant to having to like you know, be very loud about my authenticity. You know what I mean? It just, it, it just very much feels very disingenuous. So I just like, I struggle with it a lot. Um, and now I'm at the point where like other people are going to be, you know, sh sharing pictures of me and I'm just like, Oh God. Okay. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's, there's, I, I feel like on the one hand, there's nothing to hide. And on the other hand, it's just like, I just want to solve problems and sort of be in the background. And um, so be, uh, being sort of an introvert in that respect, it, the the whole like necessity of in in being a small business and having to make yourself part of your the brand is I find it extremely stressful. <laughs> and maybe somebody could talk to that. I don't know, but maybe that's yeah, just I, me. I can give a piece of advice that um, a good friend of mine, who's also a GSAP grad, uh, gave me, and she has a very successful company. Um, was you know things like social media if if you're not making money from that don't invest your time like everything should be proportional so like if you're going to be like selling your services um and you're getting your clients through instagram like primarily yeah then put a lot of time and effort into that but if you're not like don't worry about it like do do what works for you and i, and I think people will definitely like respond to that Thank you. Thank you. You know, it's interesting because I have a, a social, I, I mean, I have an impact mission as well. I've started to do a lot of accessibility work in my own town. Um, my husband has MS and uses wheelchair. And so I've lived this life since I was 23 years old, a life of disability. So last year was um, the the 30th anniversary of the ADA and you know we're, we're we're living around you know all these buildings that have no accessibility and it's nothing's changing and everything everybody thinks that things are grandfathered in so I started this whole campaign in my like local area to raise awareness about what actually the laws are and what everybody is obligated about and I've run you know uh camp you know I've, I've run forums but I find that because I'm not public enough on social media, you know, it's like, I feel like there's a need to be able to have a little bit more visibility in that. It's funny because there's, you know, the whole disability mm -hmm. visibility thing is a thing. Um, and so I struggle with it because it's like, then that's now bringing not only myself as the designer that I am and the interest that I have, but also my family into it, which is extremely stressful, <laughs> you know, because every, all of us, I think are extremely, maybe my love 11 year old wants to be, you know, on Instagram, but like certainly my husband and I are like have no interest, interest. So, but we have reluctantly, you know, had stories written about us in the paper now twice. And so it's, it's just, I find it a big struggle. It's, it's a, it's a big struggle for me because it's my personality is just not, that and I, I just wonder about that because it just seems like especially in a visual field like you don't only have to make your work personal I mean you you not only have to put your work out there but you have to put yourself out there as like the person behind it like there's all the glam shots of like the designer 
on the Instagram page. <laughs> I don't even really want to put myself on. You know? My kitchen background is a design that I did. So <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you. I really appreciate this. This has been a really interesting conversation. I want to chime in on that for a second, because that's, I mean, that's something that I continue to struggle with. And I think initially, even when I started the company, I, it, it was a, the longer version, there was another name, it was Origin Style by Nasozi. And it has since kind of been truncated down to XN Studio, which is an abbreviated version for by Nasozi Studio. But at some point, probably about five years ago, I was like, I don't want my personal identity to be you know, related to this, affiliated with this at all. Like I, I, because I felt the pressure um, and there was, that was even before like influencing was, you know, such a thing. Um, and my son used to be a lot more on my social media, um, but now he's 12 and he has stated very clearly, like he doesn't want to be in any of my pictures. Um, and then in the beginning, he was also part of my, my business journey and my business story because he was at my markets and events with me. So if somebody took a picture of me in my booth, chances are he was right there next to me. Um, so it's a kind of gray area, but as time has kind of gone along, I am honoring, you know, my feelings and my, my comfort zone. Um, and then also perceiving and taking note of how I react to what other brands and people are sharing. I saw on Instagram today, um, a woman who I've watched her journey from before even there was Instagram and she had a blog, et cetera. Now she's a mother of two twins and she's on holiday like with her entire family and she's like videotaping and sharing every, what feels like every minute of the of the holiday. And I'm just like, kind of cringing I'm looking because it's really beautiful but I'm also I'm also cringing because I'm like well what's I mean it was like her her child's first time you know going back to this particular um place where her family comes from and it just felt like such an intimate and sacred moment that I didn't want it to be shared with like her hundreds of thousands of followers um so I just know that that's something you know for myself that I'm not going to partake in so um, you know, see how you feel as a, as a consumer of social media and what, you know, what kind of your visceral reactions are to things that, things that you see um, that might help a little bit, but it's still something ongoing um, because we do have to be a little bit in, in the front of it. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Samina, for bringing up that um, important aspect of how to manage your brand online. Um, we have no minutes left, but Amy, perhaps you can touch upon um, a question from the chat about um, from, from Ali Amen, who is planning to, to launch a company um, needing a bottle design and asking about your process. Um, and then I think that that's gonna have to be the last question. That's like, you know, I, I already reached out and so we can connect offline. It's technical oh, great. conversation, so no problem. Great. <laughs> I just wanna add one um, thing to Samina. Could I, could I say one thing? Um, yes, please. You know, I think Samina, how you just spoke about the work that you're doing and your family and, you know, sort of your comfort level so eloquently and with such, like honor to your own authentic brand. You, I mean, you're doing it right now. <laughs> so you don't need Instagram. I think it's like literally just you, you are the face. You just spoke, you know, you gave us a complete picture of what you're doing, what you're up to and, and the wonderful work you're doing and how it impacts different communities. So I think, you know, Instagram is its own, social media is its own thing. And, and you, you know, you are, you are, you are an online brand. Thanks, Amy. I appreciate that. Thank you. Chelsea, did you have any closing remarks or um, just uh, wanted to say, I mean, I mean, I think Amy, you said it beautifully. Like, I don't, I, you know, in terms of online presence, I think there's so many different avenues you can go down and it doesn't have to be necessarily posting things, you know, about your, your life or, you know, ha doesn't have to be your face, your family, it could come out just in like your tone or whatever you feel like your values, your, your person, like whatever the personality that you want, like you want to put out there that is your brand. I think 
there are many other ways to do that without having to share like personal, personal aspects of, of your life. And it can be through like graphics, through um, other imagery. And um, so that's, that would, that would be um, my uh, advice. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you to everyone. Um, so, so, so appreciate your time. I've, I've really enjoyed learning about you and I hope that we can work together someday. Um, I hope to visit your vineyard someday. I hope to work with you, Rajiv, on, on an illustration or, you know, when a client comes through, like I, like, you know, I'll think of you and the Sozi, um, de definitely going to reach out to you for uh, design uh services and yeah please don't judge my <laughs> my taste <laughs> but thank you all so much and of course leslie thank you for for organizing and setting this up all right this, this was amazing thank you guys yeah thank you I'm all really so much happy to have been able to bring you guys together for this um thank you and i'll be in touch soon too all right thank you have thank a great you. night everyone bye thank you. bye bye